It was a simple gesture that launched a family compulsion for railroad photography. My grandfather, Harry Raymond Lang, was invited by a friend to ride an excursion train on the New Haven Railroad in early 1946. It's unknown if he had any interest in trains prior to this first contact, but not long afterward, he purchased an anniversary model Graflex 4x5 speed graphic camera. He later learned to develop his own film and set up a darkroom in the basement to produce 8x10 enlargements. He lived in Waterbury, Connecticut with his wife Mabel, son Charles, and daughter Nancy. He was employed as an engineer draftsman at Waterbury Ferrell Foundry, designing machines for mass manufacturing. He would later be promoted to chief draftsman, earning several company patents to his name. He began making trips to the local New Haven Roundhouse on weekends, befriending railroad employees which earned him access onto the property. This friendship became so strong that he was allowed to photograph his family on equipment, and even let my grandmother run a steam engine in the yard. Numerous family day trips were taken to photograph other railroads in the New England area. My grandmother also had an eye for composition and captured many scenes using color slide film. Two treasured heirlooms are a color slide taken by my grandmother, photographing my grandfather taking a black and white photo of my father hanging off the front of a colorful New Haven FA in the snow. Diesels had been making a strong presence on many railroads, and by 1948, the New Haven decided to transition, becoming one of the first railroads to dieselize. It was disappointing for my grandfather to watch as deadlines of locomotives began forming. I imagine it was the designs and fabrication processes that intrigued him most about steam engines. The thought of destroying everything that went into creating these machines must have seemed tragic. These heartbreaking events were compounded when they closed the local roundhouse and moved all his friends to other terminals. He did photograph some of the diesels, like New Haven's unique fleet of Alco D-109s, but the streamlined bodies, colorful paint schemes, and even self-powered train sets just couldn't hold his interest. By 1950, he had put his camera away and focused on family and career. However, once you've contracted the Iron Horse virus, it never truly goes away. From time to time, he would create pencil sketches from photos. After retiring in 1967, he started dabbling with oils, creating several wonderful scenes from his rail fan days, including one of his son Charles watching steam. He also tried his hand at a crayon rendering of a photo taken by his son. He passed away in 1971 without seeing how much that first train trip inspired successive generations, but I like to think he watches over us with great pride and immense amusement. A man and a train A train and a man They both try to run as far And as fast as they can But a man's not a train And a train's not a man A man can do things that a train never can Going up a mountain, even halfway to the top The minute that a train runs out of steam, it's got to stop but it's a different story When a man runs out of steam He still can go a long, long way On nothing but a dream
Going across the country When a train runs out of track It has to stop and turn around And then start heading back But many miles from nowhere Out where all the tracks are gone A man who's got himself a dream Can still keep going on So don't try to stop me Don't try to stop me Cause nobody can I got a dream, a beautiful dream, and that makes me a man. No, oh, don't try to stop me, don't try to stop me, cause nobody can. I got a dream, a beautiful dream, and that makes me. Makes me a My father Charles started life as a war baby in Waterbury, Connecticut, with a build date of May 1943. At the age of three, he was tagging along with his father down to the local roundhouse 
and would often find his way into photos both around and on locomotives. This early up-close exposure initiated respect and fascination for these grungy, fire-bellied behemoths. He also had an early introduction to model trains, which included a glimpse of what would become his favorite railroad. After high school, he migrated west to attend Santa Ana Junior College to study the honorable ethics of photojournalism. In 1963, he moved north to Santa Barbara to further his education at Brooks Institute of Photography. It was here that he devoted all of his equipment and skills into each and every project. He lived a quiet life as a model citizen. Then in 1965, he met Karen, the woman he would marry. By 1969, he was married with two children and employed as a water meter reader for the city of Santa Barbara. It was during this period that family camping trips to busy main lines began, along with sound recordings and Super 8 movies. His job involved working in the field, and he would often take lunch trackside with his camera at the ready. It was colorful times in the 70s, especially during the infancy of Amtrak. 1975 introduced more colorful locomotives, and after 30 years, my father was once again sitting in the cab of a hot mainline steam engine. In 1979, rising costs in Santa Barbara and relatives already living in Oregon my father moved the family to Eugene. By the end of that summer, he was working for the city of Eugene in their transportation department, which was conveniently located across the street from SP's largest classification yard in Oregon. Railroad action was constant and colorful on both the SP and BN. Operating steam engines from the OP&E and city of Portland were also nearby to photograph. His favorite adventures occurred during camping trips along the Cascade Line, where he would hike into inaccessible areas. The next three decades would be spent taking numerous railfan trips throughout the West Coast and chasing resurrected mainline steam engines. After retiring in 2003, he has kept himself busy sharing his photography through social media and producing numerous audiovisual presentations for several venues. He doesn't get out to railfan as much these days, but he never passes up the chance to be photographed with a steam engine. Chewing on a piece of grass, walking down the road. Tell me how long you gonna stay here, Joe Some people say This town don't look good in the snow You don't care, I know Venture a highway In the sunshine Where the days are longer Nights are stronger than moonshine You're gonna go, I know Cause a free wind is blowing through your hair And the days surround your daylight there Seasons crying, no despair Alligator lizards in the air, in the air. Wishing on a falling star, waiting for the Sorry, boy, but I've been hit by a purple rain. Oh, come on, Joe. You can always change your name. Thanks a lot, son. Just the same. Venture a highway in the sunshine where the days are longer. 
lights are stronger than moonshine You're gonna go, I know Blowing through your hair And the day surround your daylight there Seasons crying, no despair Alligator lizards in the air By the time I came around in late February of 1967, the Iron Horse virus had successfully transformed into a dominant DNA strand. It was an omen being born less than a mile from the SP station at Goleta, and the rail fan brainwashing was taking hold before my first birthday. The only time I spent with my grandfather was during a family trip back east in 1969. This scene, captured at the original Steamtown in Bella Falls, Vermont, is the only photo of all three generations together. 
After my sister Donna was born, we were often photographed on trains during the early 70s. She enjoyed trains, but preferred horsepower in its truest form. My fate was sealed at age 5 when my father brazenly put a camera in my hand. My first images were somewhat less than prodigy material, but it didn't take me long to develop an eye for composition. Common snapshots weren't enough for me though, and I began a lifetime search for unique perspectives and dramatic lighting effects. I started experimenting with depth of field and shooting from the dark side of the tracks. Because of my short stature, the view was always low angle, which only enhanced the look of already imposing locomotives. This, along with close-up imagery, have become my signature styles for anything I photographed. I consider the 70s a classic era and feel lucky to have witnessed a wide variety of railroad technology. Mimicking my father's childhood, I was also introduced to HO scale models and continue modeling to this day. When I entered junior high in Eugene, I discovered an interest in music. My interest in skills in music progressed throughout high school. When I returned to Santa Barbara after high school, most of my free time was spent performing with several music groups of differing genres. But I still found time to rail fan here and there. I moved back to Oregon in 1992, and a few years later, my two favorite railroads became involved in mergers. The restructuring over the next few years wasn't pleasant, and I found myself relating to what my grandfather must have felt during the transition to diesel on the New Haven. I redirected my bitterness to documenting as much as I could before it disappeared. I was able to help preserve numerous artifacts while becoming friends with many railroad employees. This led to being allowed into their work environment, which opened up a whole new world of subject matter and unique perspectives. Over the past two decades, I've had some of my work used in various publications and produced several multimedia presentations. In my 50 plus years of being around railroads, I've observed that the main constant is change.
Such jealous hearts. 